Hello, it's Keith here, and this is lesson 63 of the platform specific series of my Z80 programming tutorials. We're back on the Spectrum and also the Spectrum NICS this time, and like last time with the Amstrad CPC, we're going to be looking at the mouse this time on the Spectrum. We're going to be looking at the Kempson mouse. The Kempson mouse is um, very nice, it's um, very easily readable, it's a bit easier than the Amstrad CPC in some ways, and it works on the classic Spectrum and also the Spectrum NICS, so I thought it'd be a bit of fun. And um, you can see I've got a little example as an animated GIF here of the um, program we're going to be writing eventually today and it's basically a port of the Amstrad CPC version and um, it will allow us to click and draw a Chibico character or drag a line and um, draw some blobs. So I ported the exact same program but first we're going to be looking at the classic spectrum and we're going to learn how to read the ports themselves. Okay well let's go over to the source code and then let's see it in action. Okay, so here's the first example for the classic ZX spectrum. Now this is just reading in from the hardware itself. Now, if I drag my mouse to the right, you will see H is going up. L's going up and down a little bit as I'm sort of um, slipping. But basically, H is the x-axis. And if I move up and down, then L is the y-axis. Now, the important thing to note about this is um, I can go below zero and I'll just keep looping around. I'm just endlessly dragging my mouse here. Um, these are the values read in direct from the hardware, and that's the x and y-axis. And also, I've got left and right mouse click. And if you look at the accumulator, you can see that F is changing to D there or E there with left and right mouse. So there's just one bit for each left and right. Very easy. But as I say, the x and y-axis is just an endless counter that's representing the movement that has occurred. And it's not a screen position or anything super easy like that we have a bit of a yeah we got a little bit of a challenge there that we have to sort of cope with nothing too bad but yeah we, we do have to um convert those um the x and y axis into some movements that will make more sense for us so how do we read in well it's very easy there's uh, three ports there's f a d f we just read in from that 16-bit port with an in command and that will get the two mouse buttons in the low two bits of the byte that we read back and the x axis is from f b d f and, and just one byte afterwards so i've just inked b here to get that and that port will get the x position as i say it goes from zero to two five five but it's an endless loop it doesn't have any um, boundaries it's not not got any ability to do that it's not something that's possible. And then the y-axis as well is also the same, endless I mean, and it um, is a slightly different port. Instead of FBDF, it's FFDF. So I'm just changing the top byte to FF here, and that is the correct port for the y-axis. So this example is just reading them in and showing them to the screen. That's the only example I've got for the classic Spectrum. I didn't want to try and write my nice graphics routine on the um, Spectrum. I thought I'd go for the Spectrum next instead because of course um, I am planning to use this in a game later and the Spectrum Next is going to have the graphics I need. So here's the Spectrum Next version and we've just taken the same reading routine and we've now turned them into a full-blown program. So um, you can see I can move my cursor and this time, even though you can see my real Windows cursor, which is moving away at the bottom there, um, is continuing. Um, I'm, I've now got some boundary checking and I cannot make the cursor go off the screen. So that's something more appropriate for a game or an application. If I click with my left mouse, we can draw a chibi coat. And if I drag with the left mouse, I can draw a chain of blobs. And this is using an XOR routine, just like the Amstrad CPC version. So um, if we draw in the same position twice, we'll remove it. And that's, it's not a glitch in this case, it's sort of intentional, but um, that's the kind of graphics drawing I'm using. The graphics routine is basically exactly the same, the sprite drawing routine, I mean as the one from the simple series. Um, all that's happened is it's been changed to use an XOR now, so not, not much different there, but that's basically what we're doing. Um, the rest of the code has been converted from the Amstrad CPC version, but um, basically we'll just go over it now and discuss how it works. So the um, CPC version used an interrupt handler because the um, CPC version was very crude, the mouse, I mean. Um, it just had left, right, up and down as a, it emulated a joystick, whereas this one has a proper um, range of movements, so we don't need to do that. So instead of an interrupt handler, I've got a read mouse function, and that's going to take in the values from the mouse and convert them as appropriately for an X and Y axis. So first here, we're sitting to FADF, which is the mouse buttons, and we're reading them in here, and we're only looking at left. This example doesn't use right mouse, so we're just filtering that button there. And if the fire is already held down, then we're going to skip over this next section, but if the fire is not held down, we're setting a fire button pressed flag here, and that's so that we can process that first fire press. Now, if the fire button isn't pressed at all, we're going to clear the held flag, and that held flag is how we know whether to draw a line, and the first press is when we draw the chibi code. So we've got those two flags being marked there. I should say, actually, before we go into that anymore, we've got these variables here. 
fire down and fire held. These are the flags for the left mouse button and these are going to be for our drawing. And we've got X and Y move. Now these are new ones. These are for converting the input from the mouse. As I say, the mouse cursor will need to be compared to the previous value so that we know how much it's moved and in which direction. And old and new X and Y position here are the positions for the drawing and the cursor. And these are very similar to the last time. These are 16 bit because I needed the extra precision for the Amstrad CPC version. Don't really need it for the Spectrum Next version, but it's in there anyway, just in case I change my mind and for compatibility. So that's the variables we're using. And this is the ones we're using here. Now we've done the fire buttons there. That's nice and straightforward. But next we need to work with the X and Y axis. And it's a little bit more tricky. So we're loading in the current X position into the D register here. And then we are reading in the byte of the X position. We've inked B here. So now we're pointing to F B D F, which is the X position. We're reading that in, saving the new value for next time. And then we're subtracting the last value we read in. And then we're storing the difference, which is now a positive or negative movement on that axis. We're then doing the same in the Y axis. The only thing here is we're flipping that axis. Now, um, my screen coordinates go down the screen, but the mouse coordinates are actually inverted for the Y axis. The lower numbers go down and the higher numbers go up, which is the opposite way to my drawing coordinates. So I'm flipping that there. But um, basically, now D and E are movement in the X and Y axis. And so what we're doing next is we're reading in the X and Y position that we've got the cursor at currently. We're then comparing the values of the new movements and seeing if they're positive or negative. And the reason for that is we need to have some range checking. And so what we're doing here is we are checking if we're moving in the positive axis. If we are, we're adding the move to the current X position. And then we're checking if we're at the edge of the screen. Now the cursor is eight pixels wide. So 256 minus seven is the furthest right position the cursor can be in. If we're still OK, then we're saving the new position. But if we're not, if we've gone over the edge of the screen, we're skipping the save so that the X position is unchanged. So here's the right hand side of the screen. Um, the left hand side of the screen, we just check if we're going into negatives. Next, we're going to do the Y position. So we load in the current Y position here. We then see if our vertical movement is positive or negative. If it's positive, then we add it here and we see if we've gone over the bottom of the screen here. If we haven't, then we're, our position is obviously OK and we store the new one. If we're going up, then we effectively are subtracting that value We and see if we've carried. And if we have, then we've gone over the top of the screen. If we haven't, then the new Y position is OK. So that is how we're calculating the X and Y position for the mouse. Now, we've now got a position for the mouse. And the next thing we're doing is we're actually using this. So you can see here is the code that's actually handling the presses here. First, we're checking the fire button here. If the fire button has been pressed, then we are showing a Chibico at the current position. That's what this routine does. And then we're clearing that fire. The fire isn't automatically cleared. It waits until we've processed it. Here is the code to handle the movement of the cursor. We're just taking the old X and Y position and the new one, and we're subtracting them. And if the, the result is zero, then there's been no move and we don't do anything with the cursor. If the cursor has moved, then we are taking the old X and Y position and we're running show sprite now. The cursor is being XORed, so if we show the sprite in the same position twice, it will remove it. So um, showing the sprite in the old position is basically removing the old cursor. We then update the old X and Y position with the current X and Y position, because that's where the cursor is now. And we show the new position of the cursor here. And then finally, we're checking if fire held is set. If fire held isn't set, then we're just going to repeat. But if fire held is set, then we show the drag sprite just here. And that's what you saw before. So that's how we're doing it. I mean, say it's really quite straightforward, to be honest. The only tricky thing is converting the X and Y movements into a limited range for the screen. And I think this works reasonably well. Now, um, you could change the speed of the movement if you wanted the mouse to move faster or slower. Now, the emulator actually supports that. But um, you might want to do that in software. And that could be where those 16-bit values come in. You might want the horizontal movement to be faster than the vertical movement or something. But anyway, so there we go. Um, that's all we're going to be covering today. As always, you can download the source code for the examples from my website and have a go with them yourself. As I am planning on doing a um, game on the Spectrum next with the mouse. Um, it won't be on the classic Spectrum because I need the 16 colors. To be honest, the game requires 16 colors because it's going to be using um, stereoscopic um, 
and the glyph glasses. Uh, they won't work on Spectrum, classic Spectrum, because it doesn't have the colours for it. So it'll be a Spectrum next game, but it should be quite fun. Anyway, if you've liked this, um, you know, please like and subscribe, as I always say, because if you like the videos, the YouTube recommends them to more people, and that helps me out. If you subscribe, it convinces me to keep researching more and more weird systems and more and more weird things on more and more weird systems like mouse controls and light guns and 3D headsets and goodness knows what else I'll be covering in six months time. So it really helps me out if you do that. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this video today, please consider supporting my content. It takes 20 to 30 hours a week to keep making these videos. It's basically all I do when I'm not doing my day job and it's only through the support of my patrons and the other sponsors that I'm able to continue justify doing it essentially. You can back me on Patreon. I post a weekly update with the latest work on the current projects I'm doing. You can see one here and also the newest videos. There's a large backlog of videos that are currently only available to the patrons, although they will all be available to everyone later on. And also it's the backers who I ask when it comes to making decisions on how to change the content in the future, what new content to create and things like that. You can see there was recently a survey of the backers so I can plan next year's content. As well as Patreon, you can now become a member of my channel on YouTube. There's a join button you should see just below this video, you can use that. YouTube backers get the same content as Patreon, I just post it through the YouTube interface instead of the Patreon one, it's the same content every week. Also, if you prefer, you can go to my Teespring store and you can get some Chibi Akamas merchandise or some Learn ASM merchandise if you prefer, if that's how you'd like to back me. Links for all three are in the description of this video below. Uh, anyway, whatever you decide to do, I hope you've really enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching today and goodbye.